Um, unfortunately, Tara, for the local authorities, emissions do count, so I'm going to go into that a little bit, but not too much. And I'm hopefully going to try and encourage you know, some of the, the new leaders in the room and some of the older, more experienced leaders in the room who have already been pushing some of these issues at a local authority level in terms of some of the examples that are happening on the ground in terms of climate action. So just a little bit of background about CAROS. Some of you may never have heard of the CAROS, um, our work program. Some of the climate action plans I see, some of you have taken them. There's a couple left on the table over here in terms of the Dublin plans. But every local authority, as Bernie said earlier on, has prepared a climate adaptation plan or in the Dublin context, a Dublin climate action plan um, and submitted them to government in September 2019. Um, so yeah, just to touch on a couple of things, like really local authority areas and local authorities are at the coal front of climate change and also at the coal front of responding to climate change in terms of the extreme events. Just a couple of examples from around the country from the last couple of years, the beast from the east, storm Ophelia and the, and the droughts of summer 2018 and some of the impacts that we've been experiencing around the country from disruption to transport to uh, damages to road surface um, to fallen trees and um, interrupted wastewater and water supply and I suppose summer 2018 in particular, some of the, the, the water stresses and biodiversity impacts that were caused. Um, and it's really, I suppose, put local authority in a very upfront position in terms of needing to respond to these as first responders in terms of extreme events, extreme weather events, in terms of protecting properties, sandbags, removing obs obstacles from, uh, from roads, etc., and protecting their own buildings and assets. Um, and on the back of that, I suppose, prior to a lot of these extreme events of 2017, 2018, there was a bit of momentum gathering at local authority level that there was a need for a regional capacity in terms of climate action. Um, a business case was put through to the County and City Managers Association and the LGMA for regional offices. Um, it doesn't come out too well in that particular picture. Maybe this one is a bit better. Um, these are the four CARO offices, as they're called, Climate Action Regional Offices. Um, they're funded at, at the moment for five years by the, Climate Act, by the Department of Climate Action, Communications and Environment. Um, I suppose we have a, quite a, a broad mandate, but very much to drive climate action um, at a local authority level and build capacity within the sector. Like, there's a lot of expertise within local authorities, whether it be ecologists, engineers, planners, architects, etc., who have been doing work but hasn't necessarily been branded as climate action. And, and it very much is a lot of a climate action. Um, also on the biodiversity and the heritage front. Um, and what the, I suppose what the climate action plans is, is try and bring all that work together at a local authority level and see where the gaps are and where we need to do more. And um, we're also working a lot with uh, the sectors and departments. So this uh, summer, there were sectoral plans from a number of uh, government departments from transport, biodiversity, built heritage and archaeology, uh, communications and gas networks, and the CARs were engaging with different departments in terms of making submissions to those sectoral plans as well. Um, and I suppose translating as well, sorry, it's jumped forward there, translating um, some of those uh, sectoral issues or national policy issues and, and making them relevant at the local authority level in terms of county or city development plans. What do these high-level national ambitions actually mean? Um, I won't go through this in detail, just to give you an example of our work program moving into 2020. Offices have been set up, all of the adaptation strategies or climate action uh, plans have been submitted at the end of September, so now we're firmly in implementation mode. And there's a strong training and education that's been brought up this morning in some of the uh, biodiversity sessions. There is a need for training, there's a need for training across local authorities on climate action and what can be done, what is being done. Communication, a big part of it as well, and, and mitigation as a sort of a, a separate but a related work package in terms of how do we drive those emissions down at a local authority level. Uh, not to give you a lecture in global um, climate policy, but I suppose where do these local authority plans come from? Well, at the top level, they come from what Tara's touched on, the, the, the Global United Nations um, Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, those thousands of scientists that feed the science, latest science of impacts into the UN. And that trickles down through the EU, through national climate policy in terms of the most recent national climate action plan, but also our national development plan and adaptation and mitigation plans. And then that feeds into sectoral plans, whether it be biodiversity plans um, or transport plans, and some of the actions come from those then feed down to a local authority level plan. And they're just an example of plans from across the four CARA regions, from Dublin, from Mayo, from Cork and Kildare. Um, just interesting, in terms of preparing for today, I came across this document, which was from 1991, and prepared, some of you, will, uh, some of you are old enough to remember, but Brendan McWilliams, who was, um, 
DG of Met Aaron has since passed away and had a, a daily um, piece in the Irish Times, Weather Eye. Um, and it was a report done on the impacts of climate change from the very first IPCC report, AR1, AR back in uh, 1990. And this, this, this report actually dealt with the effects of climate change on agriculture, forestry, the green mantle, um, hydrology and freshwater resources, uh, coastal areas subject to sea level and fisheries. So interestingly, way back then, um, I was, I don't know, probably worried about my next GAA game and disco at the time, probably 14, 15, I'd say 1991. Um, and, and looking at now how the National Climate Plan has been uh, framed, um, I suppose a different context. Back then, looking very much at the impacts on biodiversity on our ecosystems on the country, now very much switched to a mitigation focus. What do we need to do to drive down these emissions? And some of the potential impacts, you know, um, the studies point to a number of possible adverse implications, including deterioration of peatlands, modification of estuaries, reduced water supplies in summer periods, less hospitable environment for salmon, etc. Flooding in coastal areas have come to pass and worse. And that's 1991. Um, so I, I tried to find it online, but I couldn't have a hard copy of it. But I, I'll, I'll keep looking and see if there is an online version. But just really interesting to see um, the, the, the narrative back then. I mentioned the sectoral adaptation plans. I'll skip through that, that uh, particular slide. It's literally just a list of all the climate adaptation plans that were submitted by government departments and sectors in September, many of which have direct implications for local authorities. In terms of how these plans were developed, there was guidance which came from the department in conjunction with the Environmental Protection Agency on how either a sectoral or a local plan can be developed. So very much starting at preparing the ground, looking at the adaptation baseline. So what impacts have we experienced in our local authority areas over the last number of years through extreme events? What impacts, um, what are the results of those impacts on the services that we provide? You know, did we have uh, houses that were flooded? Did we have wastewater treatment plants that were flooded? Did we have a loss of water? Did we have the impacts on biodiversity? So by identifying those impacts, vulnerabilities and risks, we can then turn them into actions and prepare a plan um, that hopefully can be implemented at the local authority level to help to adapt to some of these impacts that we're um, experiencing and will experience. In the Dublin context, um, these are the four plans for Dublin. There's a link there, dublinclimatechange.ie. There's a couple of hard copies left there, but you can access the plans online. Um, we were the first of the local authorities to get our plans um, prepared, mainly due to links with CODEMA, who are Dublin's energy agency, who have been working with local authorities for 20 years in Dublin in terms of renewable energy, driving down energy efficiency, bringing in renewable energy sources at the local authority level, and, and very much uh, helpful in terms of preparing the local authority action plans. Um, when it comes to climate change, unfortunately there's a lot of buzzwords and this infographic is useful from your own context because sometimes interchangeably mitigation and adaptation are used together. Um, but adaptation is very much about actions uh, as to how we manage and reduce the negative impacts of climate change. So what have we experienced? We're likely to experience them again. How do we reduce the impacts of those extreme events in future? And then mitigation is about driving those emissions down. You know, you can't really do one and not do the other. If you can drive your emissions down, you're still going to get impacts by extreme weather events. We need to become more resilient as local authorities, as a society, as a nation, in terms of the impacts of climate change. So some of the examples on mitigation and adaptation side, you'd be very familiar with them. Renewable energy, energy efficiency, um, flood alleviation, and more sustainable settle settlement patterns, which I suppose have been an issue in terms of how we've grown as, as a nation over the last 10 years in particular. In terms of the four Dublin plans, they focus around four key targets. So driving the efficiency, energy efficiency down, and, and emissions do matter at a local authority level because we actually have to report to the SCAI every year on our energy efficiency. We have to drive it down. And now under the National Climate Action Plan, we have a new 30% greenhouse gas reductions target that we need to drive down as well. So we need to monitor our emissions. We need to come up with new ideas as to how we can reduce our energy use and bring in more renewable energy. Um, make Dublin a climate resilient region. So this is specific to the Dublin plans and actively engage and inform our citizens on climate change. We've been talking about that already. Five key areas, energy and buildings, sustainable transport, flood resilience, nature-based solutions, which obviously has, has direct links to this morning session and resource management. And they're all reflected. There's over 500 actions across the four Dublin local authorities under those five areas in the Dublin climate change action plans. I mentioned the adaptation baseline. This is just an infographic, for example, for Dublin City Council in terms of way back to 1986, Hurricane Charlie, and, and now through to 2018. You could add a couple of more ticks onto this for 2019 in terms of the events, the extreme events that we have experienced. 
and then at a local authority level sort of workshopping these particular incidents, these extreme events with local authority staff from parks, from roads, from accounts, uh, from uh, various sections across the local authority and saying what impact did this have on your work area and what do we need to do in the future to try and prevent that impact being um, significant. So this is very much how the adaptation baseline and looking at the extreme events how has been built into the climate change action plans. Um, I won't dwell long on this one, it's, it, is it is about mitigation, it's really just making a point that in the total Dublin for example there's nearly 3, 000, or 3 million tonnes of emissions in terms of CO2 but less than 5% of that is accounted for from Dublin City Council emissions. Let's, uh, you might think that is a tiny amount, how can it be that small? Because when you think about, um, I suppose, maybe Dublin in comparison to uh, a, a, a city like London or Paris that has a, a directly elected mayor with uh, powers uh, over, say, implementing new transport routes, um, changing laws in terms of um, air quality, in terms of energy efficiency and buildings. Um, the, I suppose the more devolved um, regulation at local authority level means that the emissions that we have are quite small, but the reach that we have is still quite big in terms of the, the reach that we have through our community network, through our links with businesses, etc. Um, and in the Dublin context, social housing and municipal in terms of uh, fleet transport and fuels are the, are the big emitters there. Um, Nevertheless, we have been driving down emissions in terms of energy efficiency projects, in terms of social housing, in terms of ret retrofitting, in, in terms of changing our fleet from petrol and diesel to electrification. Um, so we need that graph to keep going down, as Tara said in, in her uh, earlier presentation. We need it to keep going down and, and go down even faster than that is, that is going at Dublin City Council level. The national plan is interesting because the local authority plans were all in train before the national plan came out and there's now new actions from the National Climate Change Action Plan that are directly relevant for the public sector and for local authorities. In particular, 30% reduction uh, by uh, for the, the public sector and that's, that's quite an onerous reduction. Increasing the level of energy efficiency um, to 50%, so at the moment we're 20, uh, by 2020 we have a 33% target and a climate mandate for public bodies. Um, these are just a couple of them. Identifying decarbonisation zones within each local authority. Um, 200 on street public chargers, public sector mandate, and develop a methodology and guidance for local authorities to estimate greenhouse gases as part of city and county development plans. That's a very interesting one, not an easy one to do either. Um, and this is the signature of the local authority climate action charter a couple of weeks back. Um, Paddy Mann, who's chair of the CCMA Environment Committee with Minister Bruton. So more owners, targets and actions coming down the line at us. Just switch to a couple of pictures just to give you a couple of examples on the mitigation side. A lot of them from Dublin, but not all, in terms of fleet transition, more sustainable transport, you know, last mile delivery solutions in, in urban areas, uh, car sharing, bike sharing, retrofitting of social housing, renewable energy on buildings. On the adaptation side, the more obvious ones, I suppose, in terms of flood protection, but green roofs and green wa walls, um, biodiversity actions, um, less resource use in terms of water, coastal protection and in climate action and awareness. A lot of activities going on at the moment in terms of events through tidy towns. Dublin City, for example, the one in the middle, climate action workshops through the tidy towns networks have been very successful. Four of them run over the last number of weeks. Neve was at a couple of them. Um, public consultation events in terms of the plans and, as, and uh, more recently the Corlin and Oak, Doyle and Oak, 100 centenary of the Doyle last weekend. I was, I was honoured to be part of that and helping steer some of the discussions in terms of what the Corlas are going to be working at for the next two years as part of the Youth Council through each of the local authority areas in the country. Just to touch on these very quickly, these are very big items again that have been going on for years but are now very much under the climate action uh, umbrella. So flooding projects, you know, there's going to be a need for more flooding projects. The OPW have identified key areas and working with local authorities in terms of how they're implemented. But as Porg mentioned this morning, you know, how do we do that in the future that's more sensitive to biodiversity that can use um, the, the, the land that we have to allow areas to flood naturally into floodplains that they've always done for millennia rather than concrete um, structures. And I think there's a lot more work to be done in that particular area. Coastal erosion is going to be an even bigger issue than it already is in, in, in the coming years. As, as we get more and more of these storms, more and more erosion, and, and the, the cost for those particular projects is gonna fall on the local authority uh, level. And to, to mention what Anya said this morning, those, those difficult questions as to, you know, 
in terms of a county and city development plan, we're going to have to start getting these difficult conversations as to how we designate a particular area that we know we're going to lose this area, we're going to lose those houses in 10, 15 years. We've already lost some. We can't build walls everywhere. We can't put rock army up everywhere. That's a difficult conversation and it needs to happen. Public lighting projects happening across the, the country, switching from the old sodium lamps to the LEDs to drive that energy efficiency down. And spatial planning is a really, really key hook that we can climb a proof our city and county development plans to get these mitigation and adaptation actions. And this is the role that you guys have here around all the tables in terms of supporting some of these projects, coming in with your new, your own ideas for projects and adding to climate change action plans that are already there. Electric vehicles has been brought out Look, we might not all like them, but it's a given. A lot of people drive, a lot of people are going to continue to need to drive. We need to switch off fossil fuels. Electric vehicles are part of the solution, not the solution. Sustainable transport and foot loading funding and sustainable transport, particularly in rural areas, is a, is a good way to go as well. But we are going to need to make that switch to electric vehicles. And just to finish, a last slide. Just to stress that the local authority emissions are a fairly small percentage of overall county and city level emissions, but we really do have a strong role there in terms of being leaders in climate action and actually doing what we say we're going to do in terms of changing our fleet, changing our buildings and, and working with communities on driving that change. Local authorities can't do it by themselves. We need all departments and we need an all of society approach to echo what other speakers are saying. And resource implications are given, particularly for some of those larger infrastructural projects um, in terms of climate adaptation, coastal and flood protection, massive resources needed there. Adaptation and mitigation must be in, undertaken in parallel, not one or the other, they have to be done uh, together with, uh, with emphasis behind both areas and, and actions behind both areas. And I think there really is a key role for elected members, and particularly for some of the newer members that are coming in with, 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 with new ideas, um, to help drive this climate action at a local authority level so that local authorities can be leaders in climate action. Thanks very much.